Interior design is one of the most complex business models in existence. So I tell my clients that because they feel like inadequate or they're doing something wrong or why is it so hard? I'm like, no, honey, it is not you. It is actually just that hard. Today, we're talking all about luxury with the queen of luxury, Julia Malloy. Have you hit a wall when it comes to growing your interior design business? Then welcome to Wingnut Social, the podcast specifically designed to accelerate your business through increased social media presence, impactful online content, and translating industry experience into physical success. This is your design business tightly fastened. Now welcome the hosts of Wingnut Social, Darla Powell and Natalie Graff. Hey there, and welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast. I am your host, the Grand High Poobah of all things Wingnut, Darla Jethro Powell, and I'm joined by my ginger pumpkin, Natalie Graff, until it's turkey. Until it's, it's <laughs> you're right, until it's my ginger turkey. In November, In no, I can be your November. turkey. Oh yeah, it's set. That's already a done day. I'm telling you, that is on the calendar. Natalie Ann Graff, you cut your hair. I did. In real time, people haven't seen this yet because we haven't attended High Point, but we're recording this before High Point. But now, of course, everybody has seen your new sexy highlighted haircut. You ain't got to tell them it's highlighted. <laughs> it could be natural, Darla. Well, don't, why? I thought we were authentic. Are you afraid you're, you're going to know that you have the gray hairs? No, but I'm 41 and I've never put color in my hair <laughs> until... <laughs> Till this week, till Julia, I just let, that's, I just trusted her. That's because you trust. raised Amish. Thank you, Darla. Okay. No, yeah. Oh. And where the heck did that come from? <laughs> Talk uh, about me and my Amish. Okay. You know, when I was a rookie, I had a sergeant. His name was Sergeant Hansbury. And I was, what were you a rookie for, Darla? Oh, I was a cop. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> By the All way, right. I was By a cop for I was a cop for 19 years before I did these million jobs here. As a rookie, just not even off probation yet, which is not that I was arrested, but you have to work a year in the field before they let you become a real cop. My sergeant at the time, Sergeant Hansbury, would end every roll call with, okay. And after a while, I got him to end it because it was always that. I got him to end it with, okay, now go fight crime. <laughs> Darla, you were such a nerd. I was a nerd then. I know. Speaking of uh, speaking of work and my my actual day job being a firefighter, I received my fifteen year pen the Ooh, other day. Congrats! Only Can ten more years that? to go. No, I actually can't. That's like I can't believe it. It's almost time to trade you in. Okay, guys. So okay, <laughs> like, okay. So let's talk a little bit about today's guest, Julia Freaking Malloy. Julia Malloy, man, high end luxury grand high poobah of the Bold Summit. Which did you know? I that the Bold Summit. Stands for the Business of Luxury Design. I do because I read her bio, Darla. Yeah, me too now. <laughs> <laughs> I just always thought it was a kick-ass name. I didn't really know it standard for something. Forgive me for not knowing that. But that's what makes the question so interesting, right? Because I really want to know some things. So let me tell you a little bit about Julia Malloy. She, like I said, leads the Bold Summit, which stands for the Business of Luxury Design. And by focusing on the luxury market, the Bold Summit format provides peer group collaboration Intimate conversations with industry luminaries and content that directly addresses the current needs of a luxury provider. So we're going to find out a little bit more about the Bold Summit, what it is, what it's about. But more importantly, we're also going to talk a little bit about luxury design. What does it mean to be a luxury interior designer? And what do you have to do to, to get to that level? That sounds good to me. I just want to sit back and let someone else do something. Does that mean I need a luxury designer? I think I saw a movie like that once. Oh, okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> All right, guys. Help me in welcoming Julia Malloy to the Wingnut Social Podcast. Hey there, Julia Malloy. Welcome to the Wingnut Social Podcast. How the hell are you? I am freaking great, Darla. I'm so glad to be here. How are you? I'm super excited to have you here. Just in the little pre-show chat there, we were just like, oh, this is going to be a good episode. You are our kind of people already. Yeah, I could tell that when I listened to some past podcasts, I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be fun. These are my these are my people. And when we find these people, we don't let them go. So I hope you're you're ready. You're stuck with us. You're stuck. <laughs> stuck like Chuck. We're like glue. We're like static clean. <laughs> we're like static clean. That's right. We're already <laughs> making plans to get together and have a little drink, you know, a little pre-show. We had a shot together. So, you know, we're <laughs> stuck. We have made that connection and that internal bond. We are bonded. Are we allowed to say that Julia was drinking tequila? <laughs> Absolutely, because I was Wait. drinking whiskey, so we're, it's all fair. You're going to ruin my pristine image. My my political career is just shot now. 
God, Darla. Oh, no. <laughs> I have a feeling that ship already sailed, Julia. Yeah, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Julia. So let's dig in. So you're, you're famous for Bold, the Bold Summit. Everybody in the interior design industry is very familiar with it. We've seen it. We've seen you at it. Actually, I'm going to confess to you, I did just learn that it stands for something, the business of luxury design. I didn't know. I just thought it was a cool kick-ass name. So before we get into the community, the networking, the luxury stuff, tell us a little bit about the Bold Summit. How did that begin and what the hell is it? What the hell is it? Well, it is my labor of love. <laughs> It's my contribution to the greater whole. Now, you know, this is something that kind of <laughs> evolved pretty organically. There's a fellow named David Shepard who had for like 12 years. Do you know David? You know David Shepard? Mm -hmm, I know of him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's down in Texas, I think still, or Santa Fe. Anyway, he had the business of design conference for like 10 years, something like that. And he kind of unprecedentedly would invite me to speak for like five years in a row. Because he was all about the business of design and I'm a consultant focusing specifically on the business of design. So I'd come every year and speak at it. And then he was ready to retire and he's like, Hey, I think you should have this, this event. And uh, anyway, about, I don't know, I said, I'm, it's a totally different model. I'm really busy with my consulting work and yada, yada. Anyway, about six months later, I was like, it just kept gnawing at me. I kept thinking about it and I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. It's not going away. So that's a sign for something. So I called him and I said, Hey, David, is the conference still available? And he said, yes, it is. <laughs> And I said, you and know, the rest was history. Yeah. I said, I think I want it. And so obviously when I, you know, I purchased it from him and then I had to, of course, rebrand because I'm, I love branding. So I was like, you know, business of design, the, you know, the logo and it's just the brand was not like, it did not match me at all. And, you know, I like luxury. I mean, I like the kind of higher end things. That's where it gets interesting for me. So I just said, you know, I think it's not just business of design. I think it's business of luxury design. And then I was like, holy cow, that's like, that's bold. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's it. That's it. I'm like, it's bold, baby. I am bold. So that's how it happened. And I've been doing it. I did it two years in a row at first, but I was like, it was so much work. And I was like, you know what? There's so much going on in the industry too. It's a big ask, you know, and it's like to break away for three days and you've already, you know, got the markets and just, just too much. So I'm like, you know what? Let's just do it every other year. It's my freaking conference and it's a good pace. Every other year is a much better pace. I like that actually. Yeah. Because it's every other year. So we're, we've got three. When is it? Where is it? And why should we come? Oh, girl, you had that stacked and loaded. You had that. Okay. So, well, technically, because I had the last one in 2017, so it really is like do right, right now. Like as we speak, we should probably be at bold right now. But I'm like, you know, I'm like, I don't know the fall. I've always had it in the fall. And I'm like, there's always so much going on. The kids are going back to school. You got like holidays installs coming up. I'm like, you know what? I don't like that. We're going to change that. We're going to do it in the spring. It's going to be March. 2020 in Dallas. And I just think that sounds cool. Like bold 2020. I like it. I like it. Bold 2020. And I have to say it's the branding and everything is genius. I love that you put luxury in there because business of design exists. That's another entity right now entirely, right? Business of luxury design totally sets you apart. And I think that that's so many designers aspire to be part of that whole genre and that whole crowd that being a luxury interior designer. So when someone does go to the bold summit, how is the focus on luxury? Where is that importance? forward? You know, what, what are we seeing? It's really interesting. Every bold summit is different. And I really hone in the content based on what I see happening in the industry and where the key need sets are for the luxury interior design industry, I, sh I can say. Now, there's a, like a particular kind of differentiation between kind of low mid and mid high to elite. And that mid high to elite is really where the bold summit and its content really shines because there are different techniques. And anyone who works in the, the high end to elite level knows that there's like so many, like there's nuances involved with how you're crafting a signature experience, like the way in which you approach your marketing or communication, everything has to not only run really, really well, but it has to go beyond that. Like any 
other luxury brand like Prada or Louis Vuitton or Four Seasons or whatever to be like beyond what you would normally expect and really satisfy every need beyond what you would normally anticipate for that service and knock your socks off. That's where luxury designers or those who are striving to become more of a luxury provider, they have to like really be on top of their game in a way that someone who's working in low, mid, and uh, mid don't necessarily have to do all that, although a lot of them do, but you know, that's the pressure cooker. Like you can't demand that much money, but you're still providing white glove service. That's a model that's going to die because it kills you. Anyone listening to that who does that, it's like, they don't want to pay for it, but they want all the service. I mean, who hasn't heard that? So that middle ground is dying. So you have to choose. I agree with you. I see that happening every day. Yep. Yeah. Otherwise, it's unattainable. I want you to know, Julia, that Darla and I are in the studio and we are making faces, raising our hand at each other of who goes next to ask <laughs> a question because both of us have all these questions. So I am going to um, respect my elders. Go ahead, Darla. You, t- you ask the next one. <laughs> oh! <I'm> Julia. <laughs> you, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. I see how that went. Okay. I see how you guys are. I'm 10 years older than her and she never lets me forget it. Okay. So you did mention that the marketing is different and you guys approach that. So let's just, this was a question I was going to ask a little bit later, but since you, you should mention it here, let's that tie, was my tie question. In. How does niching to the luxury design impact your marketing approach when you do get to those elite levels and you do get to those high end levels? I'm thinking social media takes a little bit of a different <laughs> part in that. So what, how, yeah, how does the marketing approach differ for someone in that elite level of luxury design? That's a great question. So social media still does play a part because it is part of the kind of street cred. So, you know, you're wanting to be in editorial, you wanted to be featured, you want to be out there in the media. And part of that, and certainly at least the building blocks to building that kind of global audience, whether it be video or editorial, is having a really strong online presence. And that it does include your social media. So that doesn't really go away. It's just kind of a baseline. But again, being a luxury level interior designer is not for the faint of heart. I mean, luxury firms or even any kind of company is hard won. I mean, they are luxury for a reason. And there's only a few for a reason, because it's like it means that you have to be functioning at an extremely high level. The difference, though, is like having that baseline social media. And then in terms of marketing, it shifts a little bit because when you go into kind of the high to elite level, it's really all about association and attraction. Okay. So you can't send them a postcard. People are in their sphere or beyond their sphere, constantly trying to get something from them. Does your business card need to be like a piece of stainless steel when you hand it to them? I mean, is this what we're doing? De- <laughs> yeah, for this- sure. Like you lay it, you, you, you set it down and it's like disco lights and it like weighs five pounds and shit and it lands on their desk and it's like, bam. It's like, I'm not messing around. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, certainly you need to be polished, like your presence, like everything that you present forward needs to be polished. But then it's also about really the marketing. At that level has to do with being a part of particular groups. So what I tell my clients, because I, you know, I don't think a lot of people know this, but my degree, my background is graphic design. So my very first job, my first internship that led to my first job was doing corporate identity packages and brochures and menus and crap, like all that stuff for like two years. I ended up being really good at operations and I hated sitting in front of the computer, but I love working with my clients and my logos were kick ass. So I ended up turning into the ops manager and and then the VP and all that. And I did other things. I do want to tell you before you go on that it really, I'm happy to hear that someone at your level that deals with the interior designers and the high echelon of interior design still values social media as part of the marketing strategy. I can't tell you how many coaches that I see in the interior design industry who are telling designers social media does not matter for your business. It's it's irrelevant. It's not important. Oh, we're just too good for that, darling. We're on our yards. Yes. So we don't really need yes. Pinterest and Instagram or YouTube, darling. It's so low bra. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to challenge each one of person that, that says it's not important. And I want them to visit. Let's do Kelly Hoppin. She was one of our Bold Summit, Bold Masters Award recipients a couple of years. Martin Lawrence Ballard, same thing. Vincent Wolf. 
They're all bold masters. Super down to earth, great. Well, maybe not Martin. Ah, maybe not Kelly either. Damn it. Okay. But anyway, they're really cool people and have an amazing business deal with ultra high level. But you want to see how many followers they have on Insta, how many likes they have for every stupid ass post they put on there. And then tell me it's not important. And Kelly Hoppins all over Twitter. She's everywhere. And she started her new video thing. Now she's doing all these Insta stories and videos and they're super helpful. People love them. So every, every stupid like two minute video has like 21 million likes or some crap. It's fabulous. I mean, she is fabulous. I love her. She is. I do too. Yeah. This is the thing though, is it doesn't stop there. Like that's not your mechanism. That is the foundation that establishes what I like to call a street cred. Like if you have two likes, that's not a good look. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, don't you think while they're sitting on their yacht, they're going to be Googling you and see if you have a social media presence? I mean, what else do they have to do, right? Well, okay. If you're dealing with 60 and over, maybe not, unless they're progressive. Anything under? Yeah. Okay. So this is the thing. Do you want to be embarrassed or not? Okay. No, not at all. <laughs> just, I mean, that's just a basic question. If you don't want to be embarrassed. I'm basic. Yeah. <laughs> basic, (laughs) then, you know, and you might be able to pull it off if you've got enough, you know, suave affair and, you know, whatever, and be like, oh, I don't even deal with social. It's just so millennial. It's so beneath me. It's so beneath me. I'm so beyond that. We're in the real world. And that whole crowd, by the way, is diminishing. The whole environment and vibe and mindset of the luxury client is way more evolved, less stuffy, less up their ass, and like more real. And they're all about aligning with their values. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to get an amen for that. And the thing is, amen. is that they're not seeing it. They are not seeing that that's dwindling and they're staying in that old dinosaur thought mode and they're just going to die out. We're going to be using them for oil for our cars <laughs> in the future. <laughs> exactly. they, they are not seeing it. No. And you know what? That's fine because there's so many more that are enlightened. And, you know, I really do think that luxury and I would say it's 20 years ago. I would not necessarily be proud to associate myself with the word luxury. I mean, it would be something I'd aspire to because I like nice things and like pretty things and, you know, whatever. But it wouldn't be something that would actually resonate with me. But over the last, I would say, 10 years, certainly the last five years, that word luxury has actually shifted and it's much more inclusive. It's enlightened. It's earth conscious. It has the ability because it's not focusing on such the, the banal things of life. It's, it's got the basics down. So all it really needs to do, you know, that whole culture is focusing on things that really match their own values and who they are as people. So, you know, vegan interior design, I've got a client that's doing vegan interior design or um, things that really help them to live congruently with the way in which they feel inside. So they're not making any compromises. And that whole group, I think maybe as people like maybe Gen Xers or whatever, that whole group of the ones that make it, they make it to that level where they can, you know, spend $350 an hour for a designer and have five houses. And can you do my Lake Tahoe villa now, please? They've gotten there because they are thought leaders. They're doing things in a new, innovative way. And that requires a new mindset. So luxury, it almost automatically in most circles nowadays includes an elevated way of thinking about things. And it's not about the basics. It's it's about taking them and not only making them absolutely perfect for who you are and the way you want to live or vacation or whatever, or dine or spa or dress or drive, right? But it's also taking it to that next level and saying, you know what? We have enough technology. We are an evolved enough species that we can actually do this better. And so let's align with that. And who can do that for me? Hmm, not that many, quite frankly. Mm -mm. So that's where interior designers come in. Right. I love that you're saying this because a lot of baby designers, a lot of designers who don't really have a lot of time under their belt, and even some of the more seasoned designers say, oh, I don't even think I'd want to work with high-end clients, or I don't even think I'd want to do luxury because in their mind, they have that stereotypical version of the pillbox hat wearing 
stereotype at <laughs> the risk of being redundant there. You know what? I have a lot of clients like that. They're like, well, we're not really luxury. And you know what? I think that you can be a luxury focused interior designer without being kind of elite gouging, you know, like super arrogant, out of the reach of most people kind of designer. My dad said, um, and he's like this big GM executive guru operations dude, whatever. We kind of do the same thing. I didn't realize that until about four years ago when I'm like, dad, what do you do? And he's like, oh, well, when there's quality control issues or need to realign operations or whatever, they call me in to fix it. I'm like, holy cow, you do what I do for cars. That's crazy. <laughs> it's like, I didn't even like, the, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, whatever. But anyway, he was talking to me one night. Did you hit every branch on the way down? I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of scars, girl. <laughs> she hit on. every branch on the way down. Yeah, I did. Oh, because the apple I, doesn't fall far nope, from the, okay. Never. My daughter says you never made it out of the tree. <laughs> That's oh, what my daughter you. says. Yeah, she tells me, she goes, Nana, you never made it out of the tree. Girl, you know, we don't leave unscathed and we don't make it that far out. But this is the thing is he's like, you know, luxury and quality, you know, which are in a lot of ways synonymous. He says those, the definition ultimately are promises kept. So whatever promises you make to your clients, keeping those. So we are going to be in the mid-range price point. You will always spend your value to investment ratio is going to be extremely high with whatever you do with me. I will always be a good kind of shepherd of your, of your resources. I will make sure that they are very well spent and strategically allocated and that everyone involved in this project are going to kick ass for you because if they don't, I will kick their ass. That's a promise that most interior designers that I work with, whether they are at $125 an hour or at $375 an hour, they make that promise. And it's the ability to be able to keep that promise consistently. And when you get to the luxury level, take it up a notch. And be like, yeah, I kept my promise and I freaking just blew your mind right now. You're welcome. I'm writing all this down because I'm going to use this on my next client. Okay, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> hey there, Wingnuts. Do you love doing your own social media, but just don't have a sound strategy in place? Are you just throwing images at the wall, hoping they stick to your ideal client? Well then, Natalie and I are super excited to tell you about our Wingnut Social Strategy Package. One of our expert social media wingnuts will help you discover your goals, analyze your current performance, build your customized social marketing plan, and coach you on the implementation. It's a tremendous value, and you can find out more by going to wingnutsocial.com slash services or by giving us a call at one eight seven seven wingnut Again, that's wingnutsocial.com slash services or one eight seven seven wingnut Now, back to the show. You've helped a lot of design firms turn their companies around, right? We all know this. So what do, is one... Do we? We all know that? Well, supposedly... Do you know that? Notes. I don't even know. <laughs> hey, it was on my notes. It, it said that you're awesome and you've helped... I'm like the secret sauce behind the scenes. I'm like, you know who I am? It's really funny. I'm Edna Mode. You're your dad, I know. Edna Mode. No capes. <gasps> no capes. No capes. No capes. <laughs> oh my gosh. I never look back, darling. It distracts from the now. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Incredibles. That's my favorite movie. Yeah. And Baby Jack. Oh. Yeah. Baby Jack. Okay, so this is for all the people that actually have kids, so whatever. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Edna Mood. Edna go now. Mood. Go. What's one of the biggest obstacles you see that designers are struggling with? Okay, so I have um, I have a very kind of a linear structural mind. So I'm very left brain, right brain. That's why I ended up in graphic design and then operations and then this crazy freaking industry. When you say the biggest problems in their business, I dissect that into a few different pieces, almost like a quadrant. So you have different types of designers. Like if you have a horizontal plane, you've got like mid as the center and then anything below that is a different set of challenges completely because they're going for kind of high volume kind of approach 
versus above the midline, they're going for less volume. Thank God, please, because if I take one more like single bedroom remodel, I'm going to freaking shoot myself, right? So there's that. So different, different segment. And then also on the vertical line, I see inward facing and outward facing. So there's challenges internally, like running your business, which by the way, interior design is one of the most complex business models in existence. So I tell my clients that because they feel like inadequate or they're doing something wrong or why is it so hard? And I'm like, no, honey, it is not you. It is actually just that hard. That's why I have a job. It's really, really complex. It really is. Yeah, it is. And then on the other side is outward facing. Outward facing is really the area in which your company, thank God, it, you know, comes in and helps designers handle that because the inward facing stuff, the internal like running of the machine kind of thing is very demanding. Thank you, ladies, for providing support in the outward facing world. So when you say challenges, I think Okay, which quadrant are you talking about? <laughs> okay. Put your get your brain in the right channel your Edna. Let's say Go. if you had to pick when with the designers that you've counseled and consulted with, what would you say is the number one biggest obstacle that designers are struggling with in their business? And yes, you are absolutely one hundred freaking percent right that it is a complicated business model. We learned that the hard way. We didn't have any coaches. We just kind of dove in and learned it and made a lot of expensive mistakes. <laughs> what would the biggest obstacle be that just comes pops to the Okay, I mean I'm I'm very clear about it because I dissect it every day. It's like a giant puzzle for me. I can tell you that there are two answers to that. One is the inward facing back of house challenge and the outward facing challenge. Okay. So we'll start with inward facing. Um, so internally, one of the biggest problems they have is on the team side. So it is a combination of the proper roles and structure of those roles and how they're building their support system around them and syncing it up. If you are a designer that is like, oh, they didn't do this and they didn't do that. I don't know if they did that. I'm waking up at four in the morning. Did that get finished? We've got a presentation next Tuesday and I'm freaking out. Did we order that? Like that kind of stuff means that when you are delegating, are you delegating to the right person for the right thing? And do you have systems in place that automatically without you having to ask, like you don't run the system, the system runs the business for you kind of thing. Read the e-myth, revisit it. I mean, it's just, it explains it all. So if you're spoon feeding tasks and you're feeling like, oh my God, I could just have done it already and been done. Instead, I'm paying this person to do it and then tell them what was wrong, fix it. And then you're just about to ready to lose your mind. So the proper team structure is really, really important and setting up the system such that it is proactive for you. And there's feedback mechanisms already in place that means that you're not pulling information from your team. Like, did that get done? How much? What did you hear back? Like all that <laughs> stuff. Just <laughs> No, just stop it. Just stop it. All right. I'm going to. Yeah, just stop it. What a potty mouth you have. I'm I sorry. love it. Okay. <laughs> I know. It's okay. Me too. Hey, listen, I was a cop. I, I swear like a sailor. Look, my ideal clients love that. Okay. And we vibe like we're not about being pristine. We're about being creative and like expressing ourselves. Now I do have some, a lot of Southern ladies and very businessy, like, you know, we have 50 team members and we do corporate like hospitality. I have clients like that too. You know, I tone it down a little bit for those guys, but honestly, <laughs> you close the conference door and they're laughing their ass off too. And you know what? We're talking about operations and like just you got to make it fun. This shit is boring. <laughs> All right. So, okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's our philosophy here. That's why we try to get a little silly and <laughs> exactly. all that with the podcast as well as be informational and getting to your point about the struggling with the systems and having to, to babysit your team. That is something that we did go through here at Wingnut a little bit, not as much, but with the design firm Darla Palantiris as well. And we have systems in place. We use MyDoma. We use Asana. We use Slack. And it, it pretty much kind of runs itself. I mean, not entirely. We still do have to get in there and do our part and in input, but the goal is to get it to where it can run itself, that Natalie and I can take a vacation for a week or two and not even bother to look at it. And you have to have those I'm systems. waiting. Yeah, I know. You have to have those systems in place for sure. That warms my heart because 
that makes a difference in the like the, the lifestyle that you live in and the fact that you can even do this podcast. If you were chasing your tail, first of all, that's just not a good look. Don't be the designer that's like, oh my God, did we order the trim on that pillow to split? We have an install next week and eh, you know, like, all right, that was fine when you were like three years into your business, but like grow the F up. You're a businesswoman or a businessman. <laughs> like, get your act together. This is not cute. And by the way, that energy level does not attract anyone that would be even in the realm of luxury and or anyone who is actually values expertise and will pay you what you're worth. Okay. So you have to level up if you want to play this game. Now, if you don't, that's fine. I, I actually have no judgment because I think like the low touch kind of high volume model has a place in the world too. And if that's your jam, go for it. You don't have to worry about the white gloves. I want to circle back a little bit, Julia, and touch on something before we get into the wet up wingnut round, because right, you just said that the low end has its place and the high end is definitely has its place, but that the middle tier was dying out. Just real quick, can you, what do you, what do you attribute that to before we go into the wet up wingnut round? So in business, like MBA 101 or whatever, I mean, there's a thing called a pivot. And so this is where you are noticing differences in your business, um, not due to anything internal. Um, maybe the phone isn't ringing as much or you're getting more pushback on things that you never used to get pushback on or things aren't selling as well. So as a business owner, you have to be very sensitive to the signs and over the last several years, there have been what we call external influencers, or I would say external stressors. And that is the environment in which we are functioning is changing. Technology has always done that. I mean, whether you are like back in the old days doing the carriage and horse thing, you know, and then all of a sudden Ford like comes hey, out with hey, the car. Easy. You know, and they're like, damn it, Easy. my carriage isn't, my carriage business is going to go out of business because it's damn car, you know, oil versus the light bulb. Like this happens, like get with it, just evolve. Okay. <laughs> so technology is happening. It always does. And it's a good thing, but it does mean that you actually have to, what they call pivot, which means identify the situation and kind of determine or ascertain the best next move and strategy to adapt to that change. Absolutely. And to your point, Blockbuster Video, does anyone <laughs> remember them? <laughs> right? They were definitely did not pivot. Toys R Us, not a very good pivoter. And where are they today? Okay, I'm sorry. Please finish your thought and then we'll get up into what up wing that. Okay. Can I just say Blockbuster? Can we all remember spending a f hour walking up yes. and down those freaking aisles trying to figure out what the hell to watch that night. <laughs> I know. By the time you actually get the video, buy your resin us and buy your like microwave popcorn, like, and watch the video, you're passing out halfway before the movie's even over because it took so long to watch. Now it's Netflix and chill. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, things <laughs> change. So the reason why the middle is going away is there's several things. I mean, online it's the network. So our Species is expanding its network, its neuro ability to sense and activate different areas and understand what's happening. So, I mean, it, almost like a nervous system. So now there's a lot of information exchange. I don't need to tell designers of what they're experiencing in terms of external stressors, but people are pushing back. They don't want to pay. It's harder to be transparent. Um, they think they can do it themselves. There's HGTV that tells them this like grand, like $200,000 <laughs> bathroom is really just cost 35,000 and you're ready to shoot yourself because your client calls you the next day and says, why is this bill so much? And you're like, Oh my God, can I just, <laughs> can I, where is the HGTV headquarters? And can I, like, shoot, like, <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. Really? Really? Don't lie. Just don't lie to everyone because you're freaking killing me. I definitely agree. Yeah. You have all of that, you know, not only like real stuff, like people are like, well, I don't really need a heirloom piece. I really just want something that's going to work for the next five years. Okay. Can we spend $500 instead of, you know, 5,000? Okay. You know, we've all dealt with that. <laughs> that was not. 
I think that's an excellent note. That Kim Kardashian impersonation is an excellent <laughs> note to, to, for us to pivot. Pivot. See what I did there to the What Up Wingnut round. Now it's time for What Up Wingnut. Wingnut. I'm ready. I'm always ready, baby. I was born ready. <laughs> what you got for me? What you got for me, darling? Come on. What you got? I don't know. What you got for me? <laughs> <laughs> Julia Malloy, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be and why? Brief. <laughs> I would be a ginkgo tree. I would be a ginkgo tree. You know, the ginkgo tree is one of the, the oldest kind of trees on the planet. They were alive when the dinosaurs were. It has more wisdom than any other tree on the freaking planet. Bam. I did not know that. Good answer. Excellent. Yeah, baby. What would the hashtag on your tombstone be? Hashtag be bold. Perfect. Perfect. And, and very on brand. If you could have only one superpower, what would it be and why? You know, this is going to sound a little crazy. Okay. Cause I've actually given a lot of thought to this. So I'm a Libra and I don't know. I mean, I think like on one side, I'm this like kick ass fucking ninja badass and I will kick your ass and I'll swear <laughs> like I'll wear like leather and kick your ass. Right. And then I have this like, okay, so my new look is kind of like a boho rock star thing. So there's this other side that's like fairies and pretty and like, okay, so I, oddly enough, I mean, I don't know if everyone's like this. I doubt it, but okay. So I have this other side. <laughs> I doubt it too. <laughs> I have this other side that really loves like little cute, like glowing blue mushrooms and like pretty little things and I love the little cute things. So if I had a superpower, which is oddly like something I've given a lot of thought to. <laughs> I mean, I have actually thought about this a lot. Okay. My superpower would be to be able to talk to the animals. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I want to be able to like walk in the forest and be like, oh, hi. Like I want to pet squirrel like i want to be like oh hi little squirrel how are you and then it would be like and would come up and like walk on me and i'd be like oh i love you and it'd be like like roll and let me pet his belly and like that's the superpower (laughs) (laughs) i know it's ridiculous but i'm like that's who i am i'm sorry (laughs) sorry no sorry i think that's the best superpower answer so far i'm in tears here last but not least please recommend a book that has had a profound Effect on you or impact on you, either personally or professionally. Okay, so can I give two? One. <laughs> Damn it, Darla. You're such a hard <laughs> ass. God. Okay. Okay, fine. Fine. It would be The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber because for the boutique model firm. So I like to dissect things. So for the boutique model firm, it would be Michael Gerber and the e Dash myth revisited talking about the systems and how things work and how to really build like the visionary, which is you, the technician, which is your junior designer and the manager, which is your admin expediter or just admin, like that triangle of support, like which works. It freaking works. That's a, that's an excellent recommendation. You're, that's not the first time we've gotten that recommendation, but that's, that's seriously, there is so much gold in that book. Yeah. Julia, oh, wait, I, Darla, I Darla, you, we, Darla. Oh, okay. Yes. Darla, yes. Can I be a mm-hmm. rebel and just yes. say, <laughs> okay. God, I just hate rules. Yes. Okay. I hate rules. I just say this one extra thing and that there is a book out there by Chris Foss that I have recently discovered. I've read twice. I f- love it. It's called Never Split the Difference. Yes. I have that one. Oh my God. Is it brilliant or what? Oh, <laughs> yes. It, it love is. That book. Do most designers need to listen to him and that book on Audible or not? Absolutely, especially in the middle tier. God, right? <laughs> so just just download it on Audible. Just get it because it is so good. It will upgame your whole like negotiation and how you think about that whole exchange. That's my one answer, kind of A slash B answer. Like I, I don't know how we kind of frame that so that I didn't break the rules, but I kind of broke the rules. But whatever. No, you broke the rules. That's okay. That's because you're bold. <laughs> Like, and speaking you know of bold, all right, fine. Please tell the wingnuts listening where they can get more information on your summit and how to attend and all that good stuff. Right now, you can go to www.boldsummit.com. And right now, there's a header that says, like, coming Dallas, March 2020. We will be 
putting more information on there. And there's actually a little like thing where you can say, hey, I am interested in getting updates on this. And Julia, when are you announcing that Natalie and I are speaking at the summit? (laughs) Today. Today. (laughs) Julia, we are out. We are out of time. Damn it, Darla. Why is this show so short? God. Oh, it's not as short as you think. God. You know what? We just like to talk. We have a lot to say. I mean, that's just how (laughs) we do. do. And we could, well, you and I will carry on this conversation in just a second here. But right now, I just want to thank you for joining us on the podcast. You know what, Darla? I am truly honored to be on the show. And I do want to just say that I appreciate everything you're doing to support our industry, our very precious industry. I mean, the designers are, are like the flowers of the world and you're helping them to bloom and like be kind of in their full radiance. And I love it. I respect it. I will support it. And I think you're a badass and I love you. Uh, I love you too. Thank you so much. Natalie Angraff. Yes. Julia Malloy. Who to thunk that someone that specializes in high end luxury interior design would be like so approachable and so down to earth. Oh, I know. We're BFFs now. I have her number. You have her. Oh, you have her digits. I have her digits. Oh, I do, okay. I do. And you did hear her say on the podcast. We're coming to Bold Summit. We're, co- we're going to the Bold Summit. We are going to Bold Summit. <laughs> I like- don't know what capacity, but we will be there. <laughs> did you like how I worked that in? I did. You always do that. <laughs> but you know what was really refreshing? What? Although she niches to that upper level, she still knows the power of social media and still thinks that it is relevant. Of course it is. And I wanted to say, but she had so much wisdom she was imparting and I kind of forgot to bring it up that social media, she was calling it the baseline. And that is kind of a a way to refer to it too, but it's the beginning part of that funnel for your sales business. And she had a really good point. You're a high-end luxury designer and then, you know, Mr. Got Rocks on his yacht looks up your Instagram and you have a hundred followers. He's going to be like, who is this and why should I hire them? But if you have, Mm -hmm. if you have, you know, the meat and potatoes behind it. Hey, he's going to be like, oh, these people are something. Maybe I, I should I like how everything's call. meat and potatoes with you. Is that because you're Amish? Probably. <laughs> she didn't believe you're Amish, did she? No, she didn't. I had to send her a picture. <laughs> I know. Proof. Natalie, one last thing I want to say in closing before we go, our new hashtag. Wow Wingnut. Wow Wingnut is really catching fire. Designers are loving it and we're sharing their post. It's working out really well. So if you guys want us to share your post and help to broaden and for you to gain your reach on social and you have a project that's super freaking gorgeous, just add the hashtag to it. Wow Wingnut. All one word, of course, because it's a hashtag. And that lets us know that, hey, you're okay with us sharing it and growing your reach on social. It's really a no brainer. It's a win win for both of us. And if you have any questions or Mm -hmm. any concerns, Mm -hmm. info at wingnutsocial.com. We'd be glad to answer any of your burning uh, social media questions or any question at all. I'm, I'm all about what kind of whiskey you like. Hey, what's your favorite color? Hey, I'll answer whatever you want. What's your favorite color? Blue. Oh, okay. And that's an email, of course, info at wingnutsocial.com and follow us on social at wingnutsocial. And then I think that's it for this week, Nat. You got anything else? Nope. So long. See ya. You've reached the end of this episode of Wingnut Social, but that's only your first step. Be sure to head to wingnutsocial.com to reach out to us directly and schedule your free consultation with one of our Wingnut Social Media Specialists to take your business from social mediocre to social media master. We'll see you on the next episode of Wingnut Social, your social media tightly fastened. How's your energy? You ready? Fired up? You ready to go? The Wingnut Social Podcast, fueled by the fat in my ass. (laughs) That's not even funny. (laughs) Because I'm dieting. That's the only thing I'm running on right now. I had a shot and I'm chasing it with Red Bull right now. Holy moly. Good boy, Mango.